because this book was way shorter than John. And, uh, and, and as I began to read, though, and I began to study Galatians, I realized that, uh, that it was foolish to think that it would be easy to uh, tackle a book of six chapters <clears throat> when it was a letter that is so uh, foundational to our belief as, as Christians. Um, Galatians is, uh, you're going to see as we go through this, that it is, as I said, foundational to our belief system. It is, has been called, in fact, the, the Magna Carta of our Christian liberty. And uh, we're going to discuss why that is in just a bit. Um, but before we get going on the video, I just want to look at a couple of verses here. Um, in, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 to 21, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for, it is, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Also in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So what we're going to be looking at tonight and what Paul is, is, uh, is uh, communicating to the Galatians um, is twofold. The justification by faith alone, apart from the law, apart from works uh, in Christ, and also the freedom that is gained in Christ because of this justification. And then we're going to look at what that freedom means and what that indicates for us. Uh, before I continue, though, let's go ahead and, and do the video, if you guys are ready for that, and then we'll, we'll continue after the video. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It was written to a number of churches in the region of Galatia where Paul that for all of these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family. Paul's letter to the Galatians. It was written to a number of churches in the region of Galatia where Paul had traveled on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the stories in the book of Acts. He wrote this important letter from a place of deep passion and frustration. Here's the backstory. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem, but its message was for all humanity, and so it quickly spread beyond Israel. By Paul's time as a missionary, there were as many non-Jews as there were Jewish people in the Jesus movement, and this sparked a huge debate that we know about from the book of Acts chapter 15. Historically, the covenant people of God were focused in one ethnic group, Israel, and they were set apart by the practices commanded in the Torah, like circumcision of males, eating kosher, observing the Sabbath. And there were many Jewish Christians who believed that for all of these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, they needed to obey the laws of the Torah. And so some of these Jewish Christians ended up coming to the Galatian churches. They were undermining Paul and demanding circumcision of all these male non-Jewish Christians. And so many of them were. And when Paul found out, he was brokenhearted and angry. And this letter is the result. He first challenges the Galatians with his summary of the gospel message about the crucified Messiah. He then argues that this gospel is what creates the new multi-ethnic family of Jesus and Abraham. And then he shows how this gospel is what truly transforms people by the presence and power of the Spirit. He opens by expressing his bewilderment that the Galatians have embraced a different gospel. It's the one promoted by these Christians who badmouth Paul and demand circumcision. So Paul first defends the authenticity of his message and authority as an apostle. He was commissioned by the risen Jesus himself to go to the non-Jewish world. Remember the story from the book of Acts. Paul says it was only later that he went to Jerusalem to consult the other apostles like Peter or James. And when he told them he wasn't requiring non-Jewish Christians to be circumcised or eat kosher, they were in full support. But this tension ran deeper. Peter had come to Antioch to visit and see all of these non-Jewish Christians, and he was eating and mingling with them. But when some of this Jerusalem opposition group showed up in Antioch, Peter caved under their pressure. He stopped eating with these uncircumcised Christians, and he was avoiding them. 
And so Paul confronted and accused Peter of hypocrisy, of not staying true to the gospel. For Paul, demanding these new Christians to become circumcised and Torah observant, it's wrong-headed for all kinds of reasons. First of all, because it's a betrayal of the gospel. Or in his words, people are not justified by the works of the Torah, but rather by the faith of Jesus the Messiah. And we have faith in the Messiah Jesus. To be justified, or literally to be declared righteous, it's a rich Old Testament term for Paul. It's when God declares that someone is in a right relationship with him. They're forgiven, they're given a place in God's family, and they are being transformed by God's grace. And it's Paul's conviction that no one can be justified by observing the commands of the Torah, but only by the faith of Jesus. This is a dense phrase, and it could refer to Jesus' own faithfulness in living and dying on our behalf, or it could refer to our own trust and devotion to Jesus. Either way, the point is clear. People are justified only through trusting in what God did for them through Jesus, not by what they do for themselves. At the heart of Paul's gospel is this claim, that when people trust in the Messiah Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. His life, death, and resurrection become theirs. Or in his words, I've been crucified with the Messiah, and it's not I who come back to life, it's the Messiah living in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the reason anyone can say that they are right with God or belong to Jesus' covenant family, it's not because they obeyed the laws of the Torah. It's only because of what Jesus did for them that they could never do for themselves. Now, this profound understanding of what Jesus accomplished, it has huge implications for who can now be included in God's covenant family and for what it means to live as a member of that family. So Paul first turns to the stories about Abraham in Genesis, how he was justified or declared righteous before God by simply having faith, by trusting in God's promise that one day all nations would find God's blessing through him and his offspring. God's purpose was always to have one large multi-ethnic family of people who relate to him on the basis of faith, not on the laws of the Torah. But that raises an important question. Why did God give the laws of the Torah to Israel then? Here Paul offers a very brief and dense explanation that he will later fill out in his letter to the Romans. He observes that the laws of the Torah were given to Israel at Mount Sinai long after God's promise to Abraham. And if you read the Torah carefully, he says, you'll see that God always intended the laws to be a temporary measure. He says the laws had both a negative and a positive role. Negatively, the laws acted like a magnifying glass on Israel's sin. They exposed how Israel shared in the sinful human condition, constantly rebelling against God's law. And so the law, which is good, ended up pronouncing Israel guilty and all humanity with them. Or in his words, the laws imprisoned everyone under the power of sin. But the laws also had a positive role. They acted like a strict school teacher that kept Israel in line until the coming of the promised offspring of Abraham, the Messiah. And once the Messiah came, he fulfilled the purpose of the laws on Israel's behalf. Jesus was the faithful Israelite who truly loved God and neighbor. And as Israel's king, he died to take the curse and consequence of Israel's failure into himself and bring redemption. And so now through Jesus, the offspring of Abraham, God's blessing can come to all people regardless of their ethnicity, social status, or gender. For Paul, requiring Torah observance from non-Jewish Christians, it makes no sense. It's acting as if Jesus didn't fulfill God's promise or deal with our sins. It neglects the new freedom gained for us through Jesus and the gift of the Spirit, and it limits God's promise and blessing to one ethnic family. But, Paul's opponents might argue, the laws of the Torah, they're a proven guide to living according to God's will. How will non-Jewish Christians learn this? Paul responds in chapters 5 and 6 by describing how Jesus' transforming presence through the Spirit is the key. The laws of the Torah are good. They're wise, Paul says. In fact, they can all be summarized, as Jesus did, in the command to love your neighbor as yourself. But the laws, good as they are, they did not give Israel the power to obey them. In contrast, the good news is that Jesus did fulfill the laws on our behalf, and now he lives in us through the Spirit, making his people into new humans who fulfill the law by loving others. So Paul goes on to contrast this old and new humanity. 
The habits of the old humanity are obvious. These are behaviors that dehumanize people, they destroy relationships and whole communities. And while the laws of the Torah prohibited these behaviors, Jesus actually put them to death on the cross. So when a person trusts in Jesus and lives in dependence on the Spirit, his life becomes theirs and produces what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. This is Jesus' way of life that he wants to reproduce in his family so that they become people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But this fruit isn't automatic, Paul says. It requires cultivation just like real fruit. Or in his words, if we live by the Spirit, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. This requires intentionality. We have to learn how to prune off our old habits and cultivate new ones. And as we do so, we find ourselves carried along by the Spirit as Jesus reshapes our minds and hearts and makes us into people who love God and others. And in this way, Jesus' people fulfill what Paul calls the Torah of the Messiah. In the end, Paul concludes, this requirement for Christians to become Torah observant or be circumcised, it's an adventure in missing the point. What really matters is God's new creation, this new multi-ethnic family of the Messiah, people full of faith in Jesus who are learning to love God and others in the power of the Spirit. And that's what the letter to the Galatians is all about. It is daunting coming up after these videos uh, because those are so good and succinct. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And they're worth listening to again. <laughs> uh, so succinct in, in the communication of the, the ideas contained in that book. So, as we venture off now uh, into Galatians, our theme passage of this entire series that we're going through again is John from John chapter 5 verse 39 to 40 that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me and that's Christ yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life and so we're searching the scriptures uh, so that we can find Christ and that's what we're going to set out to do here. Now, I have an, we have an outline that I just want to kind of briefly touch, go through. Uh, just going to kind of show us where we're going tonight. I want to briefly talk about the place of writing. Where was this written? Where was Paul when he wrote this? The time of the writing. And uh, there are a couple of different theories for each of those. And then um, I'm going to kind of break it up into into a few parts, and that's chapter one and two, and it, and it actually breaks it up the way the video did, chapters one and two, chapters three and four and five and six, where in chapter one and two, we have kind of a, a biographical expl explanation and the authentication of liberty. And this is where Paul is, uh, is going to defend not only his apostleship, but his authority to be speaking on the matter. And then in the second part, the, verse, the chapters three and four, uh, is his kind of his doctrinal exposition regarding justification and the argument for liberty. There he's going to hit on justification by faith, not works, by faith, justification by faith, not the law, and that law and grace cannot coexist. And then the final section is the last two chapters, five and six. Uh, it's a practical exhortation and the application of liberty. Um, and so we're going to see... Um, what happens when we gain this liberty and, and then what God expects from us for, to do with it. Um, and that's going to be where we t talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the, the epistle to the Galatians, like I said a, a minute ago, has been called the Magna Carta of Christian liberty. And I can't quote where that was first said, but many resources I looked at called it that. Um, it is Paul's, if you will, manifesto of justification by faith and the resulting liberty that we gain uh, thereby. Paul directs this great charter of Christian freedom to a people who are willing to 
give up the priceless liberty they possess in Christ. The oppressive theology of certain Jewish legalizers has been causing the believers in Galatia to trade their freedom in Christ for bondage to the law. And Paul writes a very forceful letter to them to do away with the false gospel of works and demonstrate the superiority of justification by faith. And I know I, I was struck with when I, when I was reading, um, I just I took the opportunity just to read through Galatians several times from from beginning to end, and and the feeling I got, and I was talking with with our pastor about this, the feeling I got when I read it was that Paul was so agitated, he was truly perturbed when he wrote this, and it, it almost sounds like he's speaking to children, <laughs> to his children when he's writing. And uh, it's almost like he had these, these children that he had raised up and, and set out and they were on the right path and then he gets, he gets word that, that, that these children that he's invested his life in have now gone a completely different direction from the one that he sent them on. And he is so upset, he is, he's disappointed and he's wanting to bring them back. And uh, that's kind of the, the overall feeling I got from that letter as, as I read it, was a, a father speaking to his children that he had raised, and he's like, guys, you're going the wrong way, and, and, and I'm going to try to steer you back. So let's look now at the, uh, the, the different sections. Uh, the gospel of grace defended in chapters 1 and 2. What happens here is Paul... Is, uh, and I'm sorry if it looks like I'm just kind of reading because a lot of my notes, sometimes I communicate better on paper than I do speaking. So if I read some of it, you guys will forgive me, perhaps. But in these first two chapters, Paul is affirming, first of all, that he has been divinely appointed as an apostle. And, and he points out that it wasn't by man Okay, because if you'll remember, he was Saul, and he was on the road and, uh, and completely knocked off of his horse or donkey, whatever he was riding there, and, and was appointed by God himself um, on that road. And so he points that out in this first chapter. What he's doing is he's, he's basically he's, uh, he's setting up his authority to, to say what he's going to be saying. And so then he launches into a biographical argument for the true gospel of justification by faith in showing that he received his message not from men but directly from God. And that's in uh, chapter 1. Then when he submits his teaching about Christian liberty to the apostles in Jerusalem in chapter 2, they acknowledge, they actually acknowledge the validity of what he's saying and the authority of his message. And then in chapter 2, uh, verses 11 to 21, um, it's a really interesting, uh, verses 11 to 21 of chapter 2 is a really interesting part of the passage there. And I want to make sure that uh, I'm not jumping ahead of myself. Because that was a, uh, for me, was really, was really eye-opening. Um, so in chapter 2, let's just look at that real quick. Uh, I, I don't have a slide for that, but chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. And so this is when Peter is now, um, uh, he's, with, he's with Peter. I mean, I'm sorry, Paul is with Peter. And it says uh, in chapter 2, verses 11 and following, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now that's a pretty strong statement there. Oh, thank you, Michelle. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. And, and the video spoke of this. Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles, eating with them like they did. But when they came, so uh, for certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, these are the Jewish guys, they came. Paul drew back and separated himself, himself fearing the circumcision party. So you've got these two parties. You've got the Gentiles, and Peter is hanging out with them and ministering to them and practicing the, the, the diet, eating what they're eating. But then these other Jewish guys come, and Paul removes himself from the, uh, the Gentiles, fearing the circ... I'm sorry, did I say Paul? Peter removes himself 
from the Gentiles fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews, of course, Peter is, is, a, is the, one of the, the rock of the church, right, at this point. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. They followed him. So that even Barnabas, that just struck me, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So Paul says, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He's really taking him to task on, um, on his double standard, as it seemed, uh, that he was setting up. And so uh, Paul, he, he, directly, <laughs> he directly confronts Peter uh, and later in the book, he, 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 when he talks about it a little more, he says, I said it in front of the others. So he, he, was, uh, he, was, he was quite upset. So that's what's going on in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, he's, defending, he's defending not only his own authority, but uh, the doctrine of justification. And um, then in chapters 3 and 4, the gospel of grace is explained. And then in this section, Paul uses... Um, eight different uh, reasonings to develop his theological defense of justification by faith. One is the Galatians, they began by faith, and he says that in, uh, hang on just a second. Oh yeah, that's in chapter 3, verse 3. He says, are you so foolish? This is chapter 3, verse 3, speaking to the Galatians. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So it's almost like he's speaking tongue-in-cheek here. He's like, really, guys? So you were, you were justified by faith, but now, now you've got to be perfected, sanctified by the keeping of the law. And so pointing out their foolishness to them. So that's the, that's the first one. And then he, he says that their growth in Christ must continue to be by faith. And then the second, the, oh, that was the first one. The second one is Abraham. He says Abraham was justified by faith, and the same principle applies today. The third, Christ has redeemed all who trust in him from the curse of the law. And that's in chapter 3, verses uh, 6 to 9. I'm sorry, I don't have more slides for you guys for these. And then number four is the promise made to Abraham was not nullified by the law. So he puts forth uh, in chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, he's talking about how the promise to Abraham when, uh, when the, was a promise of faith. So if Abraham had faith, uh, and then the law came, and, but that that did not change. That did not change the, the covenant that he made with, with Abraham. Because the covenant with Abraham was for him and for his seed. And Paul goes on to say that it doesn't say seeds, it's seed indicating Christ. And so that the law did not, did not change that covenant at all. And so number five, the video mentioned this, the law was given to drive men to faith, not to save them. And this, this, is, this is a key point because the, the Jews were, were using that, the, the law and uh, keeping it as a, as a road map to salvation. And number six, believers in Christ are adopted sons of God and are no longer bound by the law. That's uh, again from chapter 3, verse, verses 23 and following. And uh, number seven, the Galatians must recognize their inconsistency and regain their original freedom in Christ. And then he uses kind of an allegory of Abraham's two sons, uh, revealing the superiority of the Abrahamic promise to the Mosaic law. <clears throat> so those two chapters, three and four, are just chock full of his doctrinal explanation of the superiority of faith over works. Now, Chapter 5 and 6, he, take, he, he, he goes in a different direction. The Judaizers, as we've mentioned before, have, have, have seek, they seek to place the Galatians under bondage to the law, but Paul warns them that the law and grace are two contrary principles. 
So, so far uh, in, the, in his letter, Paul has been contrasting the liberty of faith with the legalism of the law. But at this point, he warns the Galatians of an opposite extreme, um, and that is license or antinomianism. And that's where, we use, that's where someone would take liberty and they would say, I'm free of the law and now therefore can act in any way I choose. Uh, and that is, a, that is a, a belief that is prevalent even today. Um, and it is known as antinomianism where now I'm not under the law anymore. Christ has justified me. He will keep me because he does not lose any as in John chapter 6. Um, he says, I'm, I've not lost any that you've given me. And so taking hold of that doctrine and the doctrine of justification and freedom from the law, they use it as a means for license or licentiousness or acting in a way that is not pleasing to God. And so that is, that is actually something that's alive even today. And Paul was uh, vehemently against it. The Christian is not only set free from the bondage of the law, but he is... Uh, also free from the, the bondage of sin. So what you see here is now Christ has, has gained a freedom from the law, but it's a twofold freedom. It's not just from the law, it's from the bondage of sin because he says that those who have the Spirit indwelling them are now free from the bondage of sin and are now given the power to overcome sin when the Spirit indwells them. So liberty is not an excuse to indulge, um, but rather it provides the privilege of bearing fruit of the Spirit, as he talks about uh, in chapter 6. So the letter closes with a contrast between the Judaizers who are motivated by pride. It's really crazy when you look at what they were doing. They were using the, uh, the Gentile believers to, to uh, puff themselves up so that they could get them to work the laws and, and then... Therefore, they could say, look, we've got these Gentiles now following the laws of, of uh, the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law. And so they were using that to, to build themselves up. And then they were, they were doing all of this to avoid persecution from other Jews uh, because they didn't, want, they didn't want to be seen with the Gentiles if the Gentiles were not following the Jewish uh, customs. And Paul, on the other hand, in contrast, in contrast to that, he's suffering for the true gospel but he doesn't boast in himself. He boasts only in Christ. So that's kind of a brief overview of the six chapters there. Now, let's look at um, the introduction part of, of Galatians and the title. The title of the book is Pro, Pros Galatas. That's to the Galatians. Now, and I didn't realize this. It is the only letter of Paul that is specifically addressed to plural churches, to a number of churches. And in verse 2 of chapter 1, it says, to the churches in Galatia. Um, so I thought that was, that was interesting there. Um, so we've already said the Galatians, they launched their Christian experience by faith, having been uh, evangelized by Paul. But now they seem content to leave their voyage of faith and chart a new course based on works. And Paul finds this disturbing. Um, and his letter is a vigorous attack against this perverted, as he called it, perverted gospel of works and as a defense of the gospel of faith. The name Galatians, uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize this because I had not studied the history on this. The, Gal the name Galatians was given to the Celtic people because they originally lived in Gaul before their migration to Asia Minor. And then we're going we're to kind of look at that a little bit more in here in a minute. Now, the author of Galatians. Um, Paul, the, the authorship is, is almost not contested at all. Uh, the first verse clearly identifies the author as Paul, an apostle. Also in chapter 5, verse 2, we read, he says, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. And then again in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, we see that Paul actually wrote Galatians, like he physically wrote it. Uh, when he says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand, instead of dictating it as he sometimes did with a secretary. 
I can imagine either, either perhaps his eyesight was bad and wrote large, or he had nice, flourishy handwriting. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there are scholars that know that better than I do. Now, the date and setting. Let's look at the date and the place uh, that this was written. Um, the term Galatia is used in an ethnographic sense, that is cultural and geographic origin, and in a political sense. So there's two different ways. Um, the original ethnographic sense refers to the central part of Asia Minor. I wish I had thought to put maps up. That would have been neat. Um, I'll do that next time. Where these Celtic tribes eventually settled after their conflicts with the Romans and Macedonians. Um, the political or provincial, provincial no, yeah, provincial, excuse me, Galatia included territory to the south that was not originally considered part of Galatia. And that includes cities uh, Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Now, there are two theories about, uh, about what Paul meant by the, who, who, was, who he was writing to, excuse me. The Northern Galatian theory, and then there's the Southern. And I, I really, um, I was going to go into both of them. I think I just want to touch on the Southern one because I believe the, the uh, material and supporting documents support that one. Um, this, so let's, Michelle, let's go to that, the South Galatian theory. Uh, so in that theory, Paul was writing to Galatia in its wider political sense as a province of Rome, okay? This means that the churches he had in mind in this epistle were in the cities he evangelized during his first missionary journey with Barnabas. And this was prior, this is important, this was prior to the Jerusalem Council, which is in Acts chapter 15. So the Jerusalem uh, visit that he, that he had uh, with Paul, where he, where he met with Peter, excuse me, um, in Galatians, must have been the Acts chapter 11 visit, um, which was a famine relief visit. Now, this was before, prior to the Jerusalem Council. Uh, Galatians was probably written, written in Syrian Antioch in around 89, I'm sorry, excuse me, A.D. 49, just before Paul went to the council in Jerusalem. So it was just before he went to that council. And this theory is supported in several ways. Uh, Paul consistently referred to geography in the political sense in his epistles. So this was the normal way in which he, uh, in which he referred to, to areas, was in the political sense. Another way is uh, if Galatians was written after the Jerusalem Council, as the, the North Galatian theory holds, um, it's probable that Paul uh, would have referred to that authoritative decree to bolster his argument, but he does not do that at all in his book. Um, also, thirdly, it's really unlikely that Peter would have acted the way that he did had this been after the Jerusalem Council, uh, whenever he separated himself from the Gentiles when the, when the Jews came, came around. Also, the, the South Galatian cities that Paul visited were more strategic from an evangelistic point of view than those in the north because of their location, population, and commerce. Also, Barnabas uh, would have been more familiar to the South Galatian churches than to the North Galatian churches because he was not with Paul on his second missionary journey when the churches in North Galatia were supposedly established. So it's most likely that these were written to uh, the, the southern part of, of what's called Galatia and that it was written in, in 49 AD, uh, and he was uh, in Syrian Antioch when he wrote that. Now, Paul, uh, like we've already talked a little bit about already, Paul wrote this epistle in response to the report that he was getting about the Galatian churches, where suddenly, and it seemed to be pretty sudden, that suddenly they had taken a turn uh, away from uh, justification by faith now to, to justification by works. And let's look at uh, a few verses here. Um, Michelle, Galatians chapter 1, verse 7, and then following those, those ones after that. Um, 
says, yeah, not that there is another one, that is another gospel. This is Paul speaking to them. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So he's saying this is a distortion, Galatians. This, what you're now following is a distortion of the gospel. And then in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, they make much of you. That's, this is the Judaizers. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. So they're wanting to set up this wall, as it were, this fence of the law of works so that they're shut out. Unless, and if they want to be a part of the club, if they want to be Christian, they're going to have to come across that fence into works. And so they were, they were using this, this law to shut them out and to separate themselves and make themselves look more super Christian, <laughs> as it were. And then Galatians 4.21 Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And he's challenging them. He's, he's, he over and over again uses almost a sarcastic tone with them, where he's, he says, guys, it's almost like he's just saying, really? Think about this, you know? Um, it's, it's almost like a dad, it seems, sometimes. And then uh, chapter 5, verses 2 through 12, um, he's looking, and he... I'm just going to read it. We have time? Let's see here. Maybe. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. So he says, if you accept that, then you just might as well obligate yourself to go ahead and keep the whole law if you're accepting this circumcision part of it. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. So he says, if you're leaning on your keeping the law on works, then this has severed you from the work of Christ. And in fact, he's very strong language here. You have fallen away from grace. Now, we, we believe that that's not possible. Um, that, that Christ has said in John chapter 6, verse 39 and 40, that he said, of those you've given me, I'll lose none. Um, and we believe that. But Paul was so adamant that those who said, I'm going to works, I'm going to lean on my own works, that this has separated them from Christ. Uh, there's an old saying, I know you guys have probably heard uh, Dad say this before, and I think it was a seminary professor that he had in, in seminary. Um, a faith that fizzles was false from the first. And, uh, and that's what, I think that's what Paul is saying here. If you abandon the faith that I taught you, and you go to works that you never did accept, the, you never did have true faith. For through the Spirit, by faith, this is chapter, verse 5, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You can see he's like writing really rapidly here. It's like his, all of his thoughts are coming out so fast. Um, and I was talking with dad, I can't read the, anything but English, but he says in the original language that he's writing in incomplete sentences sometimes. It's going so fast, he's so upset as he's writing. I have, con uh, verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? He's saying, again, think about it. If I preach per uh, circumcision, why, why would I be going through all this suffering that I'm going through? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those, oh, and this is, he gets, he just goes ahead and drops the bomb here. He goes, I wish those who unsettle you, that's the Judaizers leading them away, would emasculate themselves. And so he says, hey, circumcision, if that's good, go ahead and go all the way. Take the whole thing off. And so he's, he's really upset <laughs> at, at this point. And then in Galatians chapter 6, Verses 12 to 13, it says, It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
So again, we mentioned that earlier. They were doing this so that they wouldn't get persecuted. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So it was all so that they could have this boasting, this sick, strange way of boasting that we've got these Gentiles now and we've gotten them to be circumcised. Look at us, you know? So it was a weird, weird strange boasting going on. Now, the theme and purpose of Galatians should be clear by, by now that it's justification by faith apart from works of the law, uh, and, it's, and it's an urgent, urgent message that Paul is sending. Um, part of the, one of the keys, uh, key phrases is Christian freedom. Um, in Galatians 2, uh, 20 to 21, we've read this already, where he's talking about being crucified with Christ. Uh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, uh, and then chapter 5, verse 1, we looked at that one earlier. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And the slavery that he's speaking of is, is twofold. Um, we, did, we mentioned that a minute ago, and I just want to reiterate that, that it's, it's slavery to the law, as the Judaizers were trying to get them to be slaves to, but it's also slavery to sin. He's saying that Christ has freed us from the slavery of sin, and now the Spirit indwelling us, giving us the power to be free from this sin, to overcome sin. So uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 is another uh, key passage there. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to the, for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And there he is, he's taking another ha nail and hammering in uh, on the coffin of uh, antinomianism or this belief that now that I'm justified, I can do whatever I please. I can live however I please. And then Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, he says, but in, in opposition to that idea of freedom, from freedom unto licentiousness. In opposition to that, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And the results are the fruit of the Spirit, as we find in Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I feel like there's more. Gentleness and self-control. Yes. I didn't have that in my notes for some reason. <laughs> Thank you. I almost started singing that song. John, John, Peter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm not going to do the fruits up here now. <laughs> I have him in, in vacation Bible school, though. Okay, so seeing Jesus in Galatians now. All right, let's touch on that. So, as we see, Christ has freed the believer from bondage to the law, and, to, and, and then he's freed the believer from uh, the, the bondage of sin, that is, license, licentiousness, and has placed him in a position of liberty. The transforming cross provides for the believer's deliverance from the curse of sin, law, and self. In Galatians chapter 1, 4, it says... That Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And then 2.20 again, I've been crucified with Christ. But it's not I who live, uh, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Not by works. He says, I live by, the faith, in the, uh, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then uh, verse, let's see, chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Galatians 4, verse 5. Uh, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And then uh, chapter 5, verse 24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So there is a sense in which 
uh, those, like this pastor says, those who belong to Christ now are, are constantly, every day, this is an everyday thing with us now. We have to, once again, every day, go to the cross. What is this sin that's holding me now? And I'm going to crucify it. I'm going to put it on that cross again. And, uh, and that's, that's what this verse is saying. And then uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So um, the contribution of Galatians to the Bible is, is quite apparent, I believe, as we, as we sit here and we think, we see what Paul has written in his... his uh, basically his treatise on justification by faith and not by works of the law. This is a very foundational principle to us today in this church at Bethel. It's very foundational to us. It's written in a sharp language of conflict. And if you, I just encourage you to go and just read. It's just six chapters. And um, you'll, you'll recognize very quickly the, uh, the sharp way that he's writing it. it. It's got some severe words reflecting the urgency of the crisis that had so quickly come upon the believers in that region. Uh, he even avoids his customary thanksgiving that he writes at the beginning of some of the books because um, he immediately launches into a rebuke. Uh, the logical development of Galatians is, is uninterrupted by digressions as Paul carefully develops his crucial theme. So the entire book of Galatians, he is focused on this one theme. Um, and that to him, that is, that is all I'm, he was going to write about at the time. Um, the severity, though, is broken by tender appeals, and, and Paul uses personal experience, Old Testament exegesis, logic, warning, rebuke, and even an allegory to develop his argument. So he was, he was coming at those Galatians from every different angle of, of how to argue. I mean, uh, sometimes I find myself getting caught up in one, one path, like sometimes I'm just going to use logic on this person. But, but Paul is much wiser because he, he goes at them from several different angles. Uh, the epistle obviously has had a profound impact upon the history of the church, including this one. Um, so does anybody at, at this point have any comments or questions that can be, uh, questions that can be delayed until next week? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, comments or questions, anything on questions, anything? 